God was living in a tent. Can you imagine that, God living in a tent? Well, let me give you the full story. Some of you already know where I'm going. It's 950 years before Jesus. It is in Jerusalem. King David is living in a mansion. Everything's going well, and yet God's living in a tent. What does that mean? It means the ark of the covenant of God, which was with the people of God, was in the tabernacle. That's called the tent. And David is thinking, why in the world should I be living in such a great house, and yet the presence of God through the Ark of the Covenant, it's just in a tent. If you're not familiar with the tabernacle of the Old Testament, here's just a little picture of it. At home, you can see it on, on campus. You can see it. It's not much to look at. It's, that present-day site is in Shiloh, about 50 minutes north of Jerusalem in Israel. Leanne and I have been there several times, taking some of you. If we go to Israel again, which we will when things open up, you might want to go with us. We can see that area. It's got a remake of it. And so David feels that this isn't right. How can I come to peace and have defeated all my foes and have been blessed so greatly of the Lord, and yet God doesn't have a house for his presence? So he goes to the prophet Nathan in 1 Samuel 7, 2 Samuel 7. He says, it's not right. I want to build a house for God that his presence may dwell there. We might worship him there. And David, David hears from Nathaniel. Nathaniel says, you do that. Whatever's on your heart, you do. Now, we know ultimately God chose Solomon to build the temple, but David had a heart for it. I'm praying that God would give us a heart to build or rebuild or refresh his house. This morning, we're in a series called Compelled to Rebuild the Lord's House. According to 1 Kings 5 through 9, Solomon, as he built the first temple, 400 years, 480 years after the Israelites came out of Egypt. He was completing the temple about 960 before Christ. And ever since Solomon, the son of David, built that first temple, the Lord, to the Lord, God gave the people of Jehovah in the Old Testament and the people of Jesus in the New Testament. He's given us some kind of structure, permanent structure. Most of us throughout the last 2,000 years, 3,000 years have worshiped in some permanent structure. And so today I want us to talk about that. In 1 Kings 5, 6, and 7, we see that King Hiram of Tyre helped Solomon with mighty cedars of Lebanon. Those are the kind of pieces of lumber that would build a magnificent house for God. In the first chapters of Kings, we see the splendor and the beauty and the majesty of the temple that Solomon built for God. And just like David and Solomon and the followers of Jehovah, and as I mentioned, the followers of Jesus in modern day throughout the last 2,000 years, we want to build and maintain and refresh houses of God for the glory of God, for the people of God, and for those who are not yet part of it. Remember that when we do things like refreshing and rebuilding, we're not doing it just for us. We're doing it for those who God would bring our way and the next generation. With that as a really brief look at the biblical and spiritual background, I want us to take our minds and turn to Haggai in the Old Testament, okay? Haggai in the Old Testament. Now, if you need to, I, go ahead and look in your concordance. Uh-oh, my little thing came out. I won't be able to find it, especially without my glasses. I'd put my marker there where I wouldn't be struggling to find it. It's like... Really small book, two pages in my Bible. Ah, and the pages were even stuck together. In my Bible, it's 798, if that helps. Look in the concordance in the front, it, it, or index in the front. It's a really small book. If you've got Haggai, say, got it. All right. I, in a minute, I'm going to read there, but, but I want to I do something first. When we, when we talk about anything that's built even those things built for God's glory they have to be refreshed they have to be addressed they, they you can't just go forever I mean truth is is I've been in some churches across the state and across the south that really really are in disrepair we, we don't want that you know why that doesn't honor God and I'm not saying our facilities are I'm just saying we could use some refreshing hey Leanne and I moved in our house that we live in now, we've been there 20 years. We moved in 2001 on West Harpeth Road. And, and it, I mean, it's a great house. We love the house. But over the winter, 
of 20 and 21, we decided that we needed to remodel the house, refresh the house. And I don't know why. I mean, just because that we had those pressed wood, you know, countertops and just because the wood was swelled up above the sink all the way around I tried to tell Leanne that's everybody has that Leanne said not everybody has that you redneck from Dixon are okay with that so we we had to refresh and remodel here's a picture of our kitchen now I want you to know that you can see right there on the counter that those are those are the um, plates for the electric Things and so what we're doing here is we're this is not how our house always looks is what I'm saying. We're packing all our boxes to get ready for the remodel. That's why stuff's on all the counters. That's the way it was, and this is the way it is now. And and hey, listen, we did that for us. We did that for my kids and grandkids. We did that for the guests that come over to our house because it was the right thing to do. God's given us a gift. We've had it two decades, and so we take care of it. And that's what we're talking about with the house of God. We're taking care of God's house. This morning, as we come to our study in Haggai, what we have, I got to give you the background. Jerusalem and all of the people around Jerusalem 70 years earlier had been taken into captivity in Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. And they had been returned by the mercy of God. When they got back to Jerusalem, what they did is they started building their own houses and rebuilding their economy and planting their crops and getting their cattle and getting their sheep. And then all of a sudden, they started God's house. They only worked for two years, and then they quit. And then they didn't start till two years after. That's okay. You've got to have a living. Two years after they got back, they started. They worked for two years. Then they quit. Fourteen years went by. So we got 18 years. Nothing has really been done except a little start. And nobody's going to church. Nobody's going to the temple of God, the house of God. And God speaks. And now they come, we come to Haggai. So if you have your Bibles, Haggai, let's just look together. God's house is in disrepair, beginning to rebuild God's house. That's the title of today's message, beginning to refresh God's house. Let's study it together from the first chapter. Verse uh, 1, chapter 1. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai, to Zerubbabel. So the prophet speaking to the son of Shetel, governor of Judah, who's leading this. And Joshua, not the same Joshua with Moses, another Joshua, son of Jeho- Jehoshaphat, the high priest. And then this is what God says. Verse 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to build the Lord's house to build. It's been 18 years. Come on, guys. And then he says, the word of the Lord came through the prophet. Is it a time, this is a rhetorical question, is it a time for yourselves to be living in your paneled houses, cedar vine houses, while the house of God remains in ruin? So that's the setting. The truth is, is in Jerusalem, people had been blessed to come back. Their economy was going a little bit. They had places to live. And yet, it's evident from these verses, the people's hearts were selfish. You know, we tend to be selfish, we, you know, we, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know it, we gravitort, we gravitort, that's a new word, we gravitate toward self-centeredness, and we have to strive to have a giving heart. The truth is, is most of us are inclined, all of us in our fleshly nature, our sinful nature, we're, we're more inclined to just keep it for me instead of give it away. And that's what's happening here in these verses. They were thinking of themselves. They, they might have had attitudes like this. And I'm not saying everyone in Jerusalem. I'm certainly not saying everyone in this church or in the church today. But look, they, it's evident from the Scripture. They have plenty of time and money to build their own houses. Verse 4 says, hey, you guys are living in paneled houses. you got fine houses. Today it would just be you got beautiful walls. you got nice brick. you got a concrete driveway. you got a two-car garage or three. I mean, you guys are doing okay. And and, and guys, don't forget, you just got back from slavery a few years ago, and now you've forgotten the God who brought you out of of exile and slavery in Babylon and and taken hundreds of miles away. Now God's brought you back. And then they might have been saying this, we don't have time or money for building God's house. We want to just spend it on ourselves. These people say in verse 2, the time has not come to rebuild or refresh the Lord's house. When's the time going to come? It's been 18 years since you came back. How long is it going to take for you? Think about me. That's what the Lord's saying. The Israelite people rebuilt their community, rebuilt their houses, rebuilt their family life, but not God's house, not the house of worship. Jerusalem was full of, full of people who weren't thinking about God first and foremost. They might have had this attitude. We really don't care if God's house is empty, 
And we don't really care if it wastes away or is desolate. The King, the New American Standard says desolate, lies desolate. By definition, that is deserted of people and going to waste. Not only did they not want to build the house of God, it appears they didn't want to go to the house of God. That's not a good thing for any people at any time. Not a good thing. They had been saved and brought back from bondage in exile, and yet they're forgetting the one who provided them their freedom. I, I can't look at it any other way except they were selfish and they did not have the same heart that David and Solomon had. Now, unfortunately, in some instances, this scenario that I've just laid out about hearts that are kind of hard toward God, it has a, it has a ring of truth about some modern-day Western churches. It's, it, even, it, even if those go, they don't have a passion about God. They don't have a heart for God, even if they attend out of ritual. Now, I want you at home and you on campus to hear me loud and clear. Focus in here. I am so thankful that this, what I just laid out, does not sound like you, one iota. That's not you. Your giving is amazing. I mean, the funds that we have to do the ministries we have, thank you, thank you. But if we're not careful, we could slip into that personally. And it may be that some are. Think about it. We'll talk more about that. These folks didn't have the right heart. Now, the truth is, is I love it when our heart's not right is God doesn't leave us where we are. I mean, isn't that great? God didn't just say, okay, go away. I'm done with you. I'm throwing out the Israelites. What did he do? He called them to himself. That's the beauty of the God that we serve. He is not a God that wants to throw out. He's not a God that wants to throw you away and let you waste away and go away. He's always lovingly wooing you back to himself. So the people's hearts are convicted, and you can see that in verse 5 through 11. And he starts by saying this, verse 5, The Lord Almighty says, Give careful thought to your ways. Man, that's worth stopping for a minute. Think about your ways. The truth is, is if we don't think about our ways, we're prone to slip. You know that you don't just slip or drift toward God. You slip or drift away from God. Movement toward God is always intentional. I wish I had a pen. I'd drop it. I could hear it on this floor. Do you agree, yes or no? Movement away from God is easy. Movement toward God has to be intentional. That's true. Nobody drifts toward God. It's because the world and because the things of this world and the demons of this world, if you believe in such, and I do, they're always drawing you away from God. I have to make the volitional, that's a 50-cent word that means I have to do it on purpose to move toward God. In worship, in attendance in church, personal quiet time is the best thing you can do. A daily devotion, 25 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day will change your life. Do it six months, you'll never be the same. That's what God did in my life. So they were being convicted by the Lord, and he just says, think about it. And then he says some things that are interesting. He says, verse 6, you plant, but you're not harvesting a bunch. You eat, but you don't seem to be satisfied. You drink, you don't get filled. You put on clothes, you're still not warm. And here it is, you get your paycheck, and it seems like the purse, your money bag, has a hole in the bottom. Why is there never enough? Now that's interesting. And then the Lord says because my house remains in ruin while each of you is busy with your own house basically the guy says man y'all are ignoring me don't ignore me i need to be not just part of your lives first in your lives i think matthew addresses it said seek ye first the kingdom of god and all these things will be added it's not saying god doesn't want you to have a nice house or a nice car or even a boat i got a boat for crying out loud i've had the same boat for 20 years 19 years, and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful competition water ski, a slalom ski boat. Lewis taught me to barefoot, Pastor Lewis, 20-some-odd years ago, and my family went out and bought a boat. We bought it with cash. Let me just give you a piece of advice financially. Don't borrow things that depreciate. Borrow for things that appreciate, unless you're starting a business. That's what I tell people. If you're starting a business, borrow. You're buying a house, borrow. Buying land, borrow. Don't borrow for, for things if you don't have to. So, here, the people's hearts are getting convicted. God's saying, is your selfishness leaving me out? Is that getting you anywhere? 
And the answer is no. And then verse 7 again, give careful thought to your ways. And, and, and here it is. The more we get when we're not including God, the more we want. I want to, I'm just, listen, today I'm just being honest with you guys. I'm mad, not, I'm, not, I'm not pointing at anybody, mad at anybody. I've already told you, I think you're one of the most generous churches on planet earth. I'm thankful for you. But I know some of us still need to get better in our giving of our time, talents, and our finances. We can all get better, me included. But there's, there's probably very, very few of us in this room that are living today with less income than we had a decade ago. And most of us, including me, I haven't been in Thompson Station Church for 32 and a half years, and I'm living in my third house. It'll be my final house, but I started here, and then I went there, and then I went there, and, and, I, and, I, and we're done, I think. And, and having a nice house is great. My mom, this is what my mom, you know, if you listen to your mom, and do what our mom says, we'd all be better off. Can I have an amen? My mom says, Tom, she told me this from the time I was little, a couple of good things. She said, choose your friends with care. You become who they are. And then she always said, nothing wrong with possessions. Just don't let them possess you. Nothing wrong with possessions. Just don't let them possess you. If you possess it, then you have the freedom to give and take. I told our staff this morning, whatever God gives you, hold loosely. Because you should be a conduit. You should not be a pond that scums over, something goes in and never goes out. You need to be a reservoir through the goodness of God and let it flow out in different directions. And you know what? As long as you and I do that, God will just keep pouring and pouring and pouring so that we can pour out to others. That's the way God works. I, I truly believe that many families, even Christian families, have difficulty with their finances is because they, they don't stop and talk about it as husband and wife and say, where are we including God in our finances? And we've got a nice house, we've got nice cars, our kids, and we go to Disney for vacation every year. We, we go to weekend trips with ball clubs and cheer clubs, and, and we have a boat, and we have a slip at the lake. And, and you look, dot, 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 and then all of a sudden we say, oh, too bad, there are no finances left for God. Are you kidding me? The Bible says first fruits. God ought to be up here. And then, you know what? I truly believe if you put God up here, all that stuff, is, it's going to get better than it would be without him. Leah and I can attest to that. Never been a time in our lives we didn't tithe have we been together. I think true satisfaction doesn't come from getting all I can, canning all I get, and sitting on the lid. I don't think satisfaction comes from that. I think satisfaction comes from everything I have, God, you've given me. And should you speak to my heart, I gladly and freely give it. Because I know that you are the author of all things good. And whatever I need you give and a lot of what I want you give, and I can share that. That's the beauty of it is that we can be conduits of the love of God and the funding of God. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. True satisfaction comes from service to Jesus and his kingdom. And then God tells them this. He says, do something that will really make a difference, really last forever. Something that will really last forever. Rebuild and refresh my house. And uh, you, if you're taking notes, put that down. I mean, invest in the kingdom of God because it never wastes waste away. Everything else... Everything else will waste away when eventually. Only what's done for God. There's an old saying that says, Only one life to live will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's it. And again, I'm not saying don't have nice things. I said make sure you don't have nice things at the exclusion of God in your finances. That, that won't get you where you need to go. Be careful. Give careful thought to your ways. There it is again in verse 7, 5 and 7. Just think about your life. Be honest. Be honest. Talk with your spouse about it. Be honest. Let the, law, let the Lord speak to your heart. And, and God did that to the nation of Israel there in Jerusalem, and, and they, they did something. Here's what happened. Their hearts were changed. I mean, anytime we get honest before God, anytime we turn our attention to God, God will speak to us, and then we'll be moved to do something about what he speaks. Look at, look at the verse 12. Zerubbabel and and Joshua, and then it says in the second phrase or third phrase, the whole remnant of people, everybody that came back from captivity, everybody that was in exile, everybody in Jerusalem and the surrounding countryside, they all heard and obeyed the voice of God. It's beautiful. It says they feared the Lord. That means they reverenced God. They honored God. And then here's what's beautiful. When we turn our heart toward God, listen to verse 13. The Lord's messenger gave this message from the Lord, from God himself. He says, I am with you. 
Friends, there's never a better phrase that you can hear than God says, I'm with you. Friends, I'm thankful for my wife. I'm thankful for my kids. I'm thankful for my staff. I'm thankful for all the lay leaders and friends I have in this church. But I'm telling you what, I, I, I need God more than I need anything else. I need Jesus. I do. And he says, I'm always with you. That's what God told him in the Old Testament and Jesus hung on Calvary's cross. He told us in the New Testament, I'll never leave or forsake you. He opens up his arm and says, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. I'll never abandon you. He's in heaven today. He's at the right hand of God. Jesus is praying for you and says, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. If you hear nothing else today, God is with you. You are not alone. God humbled their hearts. They humbled their hearts. They just chose obedience. The first step of obedience is action. They didn't talk about it or think about it. They did something. They had a fear, a reverence for God. And, they, and then you know what? When they turned their heart to God, he just overwhelmed them. They sensed his presence. There's nothing in life more powerful, more penetrating in your heart, more perfect and beautiful than the presence of God. Man, when God comes and speaks to me in my quiet time and I begin to write what he's telling me, when I begin to worship him, when I'm listening to praise music, man, the presence of God is sweet. If you're not doing that, do that, do that. Seek the presence of God. They experienced. Look at verse 13. I'm with you. And then he says, the Lord stirred up their spirits. And it wasn't just Jerubbabel or Zerubbabel or, or, or Joshua. It was the whole people, all of us. Friends, the presence of the Holy Spirit isn't reserved for the pastor and the worship leader and the staff or the elders or the leaders. It's for everybody. Man, and if you don't have the presence of God with you, and you know you're a believer, he's with you, you just hadn't acknowledged it, you hadn't received it. Man, just get with God alone sometime in your bedroom and say, Jesus, Jesus, Holy Spirit, come touch me and fill me. I want you, I want you. God never refuses that. Get alone with him long enough to hear his voice and sense his presence. God stirred their hearts. There's nothing greater than God stirring our hearts man think about what's happening in this church some of us just go and, and, and we're kind of on the ride but we don't think about the details God is moving with his spirit here I mean like that video said over 200 baptisms that was a few weeks ago we have 235 baptisms with, with one more today it's awesome and, and the giving I told you about the giving we ended COVID like the worst year on the planet listen to me with God's goodness and your generosity your giving we ended last year with $785,000 to the black to the good in the bank praise God for that church think about that who does that who does that we're able our finance team and our staff were able to set some of those funds around outside for for maintenance of big things like roofs and and air conditions that cost fifty thousand dollars hundred thousand dollars a unit they're smart to do that on our behalf but we've got some money set aside for this campaign already and that's a great thing i'll tell you more about that in a minute God's just blessing us by stirring our hearts through camp and VBS. Guest families every Sunday. 15 or 20 families moving our way. Our attendance, why you th- we're changing times because we think in January we'll probably need a third service. God is so good to us. And then they went to work. It says they went to work refreshing or rebuilding God's house. That's what it says in verse 14. They began to work. God says, I'm with you. God came to stir their hearts, and they went to work. Friends, it, listen, when you pray about this, I don't want you to pray. God, I sure hope you tell a lot of people to give that campaign. That's what Tom wants. <laughs> that ain't the right prayer. The right prayer is, God, what are you speaking to my heart to do my part to fund your kingdom, to build your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven? That's what our prayer ought to be. They went to work. They went to work. The beauty of it is verse 14. If, if you have your Bibles, look at verse 14, the last two words. Haggai 1, 14. They began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God. And they personalized it. I want you to think about this is my Jesus, my Savior. This is my church. I'm a part of this kingdom work on this corner going out to the, from the neighborhoods to the nations. Personalize it. 
When you come and talk to me, don't say your church. Say our church. This is your church. Well, I mean, we ultimately know the church belongs to the Lord, but this is our family. You're part of it. I invite you to come be a part of it. And when you begin to do that with your time serving and with your talent in leading and in your finances giving, friends, all of a sudden the whole thing takes a different perspective, gets a different measure. And by the way, when we, I'm going to talk about specific giving in just about two minutes. When I do that, I'm not asking everybody to give the same thing. I'm asking everybody to give something. That's what I'm asking. Here's the project. I've had people in the, the lay people, leaders say, Tom, ask for everything you believe we should have at this moment. And so I'm doing that. For the due project, the exterior, every building all the way around, for the interior, the welcome center, hallways, bathrooms, and for the worship center, $1.5 million. $1.5 million. That's what we believe it'll take. That's what our contractor said. The beauty of that is we have almost a third of that already. We have 400000 set aside by our finance team. So $1.1 million. Now, we need at least 800000 on the 8th of August and through the rest of the year, even given and pledged, to do the very minimum. But that's not what I want. I don't, I don't want us to do a minimum thing for God. I want us to do the whole thing for God, for His honor. So when I think about this, in this fast-growing community, we're doing this, not just for ourselves. Again, some of you might say, well, Tom, I'll worship in that tent. I know you will. You love Jesus, but not everybody will. Somebody that moves here from out of town, somebody who hasn't been around, somebody who doesn't know the Lord, somebody who hasn't been in church. Friends, I want everything about us to say, yes, 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 come in. Yes, 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 we want you. Yes, 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 we're prepared and ready for you. We have the fine facilities for you in this fast-growing community. Now, some of you, I just want to address this right up front on the first Sunday. I've only got 14 days. I've only got two more messages on this. Listen, out of Haggai. And by the way, you don't want to miss the eighth. My mama wrote the outline. Sent it to me years ago. My mom was a better preacher than me. So, listen to this. Some may think, not many of you, but a few of you might think, $1.1 million you're asking, Tom, that's a lot of money. I'm going to sit down and argue with you all day long. That is not a lot of money. Not in today's world. And you say, how can you think that? It's a lot of money for any one of us. It's a lot of money for any ten of us. It's not a lot of money for any thousands of us. You know, we have give or take a thousand families that worship here. That's not a lot of money. Think about this. The average cost of a house in Thompson Station right now, a realtor friend told me, 590000 in Thompson Station. Spring Hill, the average cost of a house is 550000 If you live in Franklin, the average cost of a house, $912,000, almost a million dollars. If you live east of Thompson Station Road, if you live north east of Highway 31, north of Thompson Station Road, south of 840, and west of 431, your house costs anywhere from 600000 to $1.1 million. And you say, well, Tom, my house costs 350000 Well, for every one of you, there's two that a house costs 600000 I'm telling you the truth. And so, why are you telling me this, Tom? Because I want you to listen to this. Just per se, some 1,000 families at Thompson Station Church that worship here, give or take, and their average cost of house is $500,000. I had to get a calculator. That's $500 million. In other words, I'm telling you that give or take our congregation, TSC, with our nearly 1,000 families that worship here off and on. Listen, a half a billion dollars worth of houses and properties, not counting retirements or savings or possessions or anything else. Friends, a half a billion dollars, and you talk about $1.1 million, I'm telling you that's tiny compared to what we all together have. So I'm, I told Sam this morning, don't ever apologize for asking anybody to give generously and sacrificially to the work of God, the kingdom of God, so people can come to Jesus. And I'll not back down or apologize about it. And I'll argue with you all day long if you'll buy my lunch. <laughs> I'm saving my money to give on the 8th. I won't tell you who, but I look out here today, there's a family, the first time I mentioned it from the pulpit that week, they gave 10 grand. $10,000 the first time they heard about it because they want to be all in on what God's doing. So do I. I think so do you. This is all of us together. So what I'm asking for you to do is help us reach $1.1 million. How to do this? 
how to do this on August 8th and then committed, give some of it then, half of it then, whatever you can then. And if you need to make payments, give pledges through December, end of the year. Some of you get end of the year bonuses to reach the goal of 1.1 million. You saw the video of what we want to do, exterior, interior. The truth is, is we want an LED screen. You can't go to a church our size anywhere in America that doesn't have two LED screens. I'm just telling you. Anybody under 40 lives in an LED screen. Go to, hey, go anywhere for any entertainment, friends. I don't want people to come in here and say, the world does it way better than Thompson Station does it. For the glory of God, David didn't give junk to build the temple of God. David gave good stuff. I want good stuff for the glory of God to reach people for God with no apologies. I just want you to pray about it. How are we going to do that together? I'm going to tell you. Listen to me at home. I want you to be a part of it. Listen to me on campus as we move toward, as we move toward this goal in two weeks. I'm asking you right now, every family in this room, to give one house payment minimum to this campaign, to the Compelled Challenge. One house payment. Well, Tom, you're talking about a house payment I make? Absolutely. Instead of 12 house payments this year, I want you to make 13. 12 for you and one for God. That's less than 10% of your house payments to God. 13. So you say, well, my house payment is $2,400 a month. Well, see if you can get out of your, your, your savings account 12 hundred and then give the other 1200 over September, October, November, and December. That'd be 300 a month. Friends, I'm asking you to give to the kingdom of God. Not that I don't benefit from this. The Hillcrest campus will and our campus will here. And think about that. If all of us do that, we will surpass our goal and have more funds to do more kingdom work. And that's how I'm asking you to do it. One house payment. Now, I don't want you to do anything my wife and I hadn't prayed about. And, I, and, I, and I, I told our staff this. I always edge in between. The Lord has blessed us. And you think, well, I'm giving to something over and above my tithe. Friends, Leanne and I have been giving to something over and above our tithe since 1990 when we got here. We were in a building campaign 21 straight years. That means we gave our 10% tithe and anywhere from 5 to 9% above that for the building campaign. 21 years, seven. If you've been in church, we had seven three-year campaigns back to back. We built 90, 93, 96, 99, 2002, 2005, 2008. How can you remember that so quick? It's because those were powerful, meaningful, life-changing years. Don't you forget the building you're sitting in, somebody else paid for some of you paid for it because you were here, but many of you weren't here when we built it. The building your kids meet in and have VBS in, have fun in, somebody else did what I'm asking you to do for you. Man, we stand on the shoulders of giants in the faith. I've had people sell cars. We've had people sell cars. We've had people take their diamond rings off and sell it and give it to this altar to fund the kingdom of God. We pay people, say, I'm going to drive this junk car another two years for this opportunity to serve and give. Now, I'm not apologizing, and I'm not mad. I'm just telling you the truth. You give, and I promise you God will bless you. And, I, and again, I want you to know Leanne and I are in. We are giving between three and four house payments, and we got a house payments. And that means we're going to give over $10,000, five digits. I just want you to know we're all in. I'm not playing. I believe in what God's doing here. We've just scratched the surface of what God's doing here. We're going to have campuses and church plants and missionaries around the world. And we're going to have this place packed three times. And then we're going to have to decide we're going to do a Sunday night service. We have two Sunday night services. We're going to start another campus somewhere else. See, that's what I want. Man, I don't want to get to the end of my line, the end of my life. I don't stand before God and said, man, I had so much more, but you were selfish, Tom. And then you were scared because you wouldn't challenge your people to step up and do something great for God, something that lasts for eternity. Man, and you know, do you, <laughs> do you know what's so exciting? Is I know two things. First, I know God. And then I know you. I know you, 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 and I know you. When you've been somewhere 32 and a half years, you know him. And when you see God do it over and over and over and over again, we're going to get it done. 
with the grace of God and the generosity of your hearts and the sacrificial giving of your hearts, we're going to get it done. One house payment minimum. Oh, by the way, some of you got your house paid off. Five house payments that you would be making, please. And the truth is, some of you, some of you could literally get $50,000. Some of you have got retirement funds out the wazoo, and you know your kids don't deserve all of it. <laughs> you're thinking, some of you thinking, if they don't straighten up, you're going to cut some of it. Well, cut it and give it to Jesus. Amen. Hey, all I'm asking you is right now, take in your hand this envelope. We're going to be done in three minutes. Take in your hand this envelope. Three minutes from right now. I'm looking at the clock. Take your hand in this envelope. And we're just going to pray right now. So guys, if you're with your spouse and kids, I kind of want you to huddle up, put your arm around your spouse. Moms, if you're here without dad, you just get with your kids if they're here. Teenagers, if you want to get with a buddy. By the way, you're not exempt, teenagers. Y'all work. Y'all got money. Your kids give y'all $50 a week for nothing. Good night. Give some of that to Jesus. All right. Bow your heads right now, all over this room. And I want you to whisper a prayer. Dad, mom, teenager, wherever you are, I want you to whisper a prayer out loud. And the prayer is something like this. Lord, everything I have, you've given me. I want to be faithful. Speak to my heart. And give me the courage to obey. I say yes. Because I'm compelled by the love of Jesus. And I will, I will step up to this challenge trusting you. Some of you are going to receive a number from God that's bigger than what you can imagine. And God's going to enable you to do that for His glory. David thanked God in 1 Chronicles 29. He said, Lord, everything we've given to you. And by the way, David gave about $400 million to building the temple in today's dollar. He said, Lord, everything I'm giving you, you gave to me. And all the people rejoiced that everything they had, God gave them and they gave it back. God's speaking to your heart right now. And over the next two weeks, you're going to pray about this with your family and in your quiet time. Lord, everything I have is yours. How can I help fund the refreshing of your house for the glory of God for the people of God and for those that we will reach in our community thank you Jesus thank you Jesus amen look right up here if you need to talk to someone about baptism like Elijah if you need to give your life to Christ if you just need prayer about any hurt or struggle the prayer clinic is open right down this hallway elevator take a left first door on the right They'll be there praying with you. God, bless your people, your great and generous people. Speak to our hearts in 14 days. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I'm on a Daniel fast for 21 days. It's been seven days. If you want to join me, some kind of fast, praying and asking God, you do that. Love you at home. Love you on campus. You're dismissed.